We thank you for your presence, not only at this time, but with us individually and corporately since the beginning of this conference. We thank you for all the other ministers. We thank you for the officers and the brethren who are making this a successful conference. Father, we pray you continue to work with every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for all that we have heard and learned and received already from you through the various areas of the worshiping session and the ministration of your own children. As we come before you now, we open up and we pray that you give us what you have for us in Jesus' name. Teach, preacher, and the audience at the same time. And may we hear your voice, may we hear your word, may we hear what you want us to know at this hour, at this moment, to contribute something to our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Yesterday, I spoke about redeeming the time, living wisely. But then, I spoke much on the walk of the Christian. Today, we're going to look at the talk of the Christian. You see, in the natural, we walk, then we talk. And as you look at these passages that we examined yesterday, I will take some of those passages again, we'll see that if we're going to live wisely, and if we're going to walk consistently and wisely too, we must take into consideration the talking of the believer. These two are necessary for living wisely, the walk and the talk. You know that a Christian very often may cloud his own testimony or destroy his own profession by his own proclamation. You know, sometimes we're told that our lives speak so loud that people can't hear what we're trying to say. And so tonight, as we look at the challenge of Scripture, that we should live wisely, we'll talk about wisdom, we'll talk about our words as well. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 5, and six. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Then it says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. In verse five, it says, redeem the time. Then in verse 6, it says, if you are going to redeem the time, you must talk wisely. In Ephesians chapter 5, we read from verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You'll see the connection between our walk and our talk in that passage. As soon as the apostle says, redeem the time, he then says, understand the will of God. Be filled with the spirit of God and speak to yourselves in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. James chapter 3 from verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? 
let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envy and strive in your hearts, glory not, nor lie against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly and sensual and devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Again, you can see here that the apostle links up our walking in wisdom with the way we talk. And it is so important as we talk about living wisely, walking wisely, talking wisely, redeeming the time, buying up opportunities for eternal rewards that we must seek to walk and talk, live, act, and move in the wisdom of God. Today I want to talk about two points. Point one, wisdom in new creatures. And point two will be the words of new creatures. We often hear the complaint from Christians that they do not have the needed wisdom to live wisely or to make the proper judgments through proper evaluation of their circumstances. But I think we need to correct something here because you will see that the scripture makes us to understand that at the point of salvation, we all have a measure of wisdom. What is, what is wisdom? Wisdom is applied knowledge. Could I get saved without applying the knowledge of what I heard about the Lord? What is wisdom? Wisdom is considering my circumstances and making a wise decision. What does a sinner do before he gets saved? He hears the word of God. He considers the word of God. He considers the circumstances and he makes the wisest decision he has ever made. Of course, it is the gift of God that before a person can be born again, he can think, he can evaluate, he can look at all the things that are presented before him, and then he makes a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, if we have been born again, we have a measure of wisdom. Without that wisdom, we couldn't have made a wise choice in giving our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So then, if we knew the scriptures, not everything, but some scriptures that made us to take the decision to take the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That decision was taken in wisdom. That means then, you are born again, you have the wisdom of God in you. And as soon as Christ becomes present, you know that wisdom is also present. Because we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Verse uh, chapter 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is of God, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Here we are told that the moment a child of God gets into that kingdom of God, he has eternal life. We know no doubt he has redemption. Not only that, is set apart for the Lord and to the Lord. is taken away from sin and is brought to the Savior. He gets away from the world. He gets to the Lord. And is set apart by the very fact that he hands himself over to the Lord. He is set apart unto the Lord. And then the Lord imputes and imparts righteousness unto him. But then this verse is not talking only about redemption and being set apart and righteousness. It's also talking about wisdom. And it says of him, 
are ye in Christ, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Which means then that the moment a person receives the Lord as his personal Savior, there is something he has. He has wisdom. And it would be a wrong statement for a child of God to say, I don't have any wisdom. If you didn't have any, you couldn't have made the Lord your own Savior. You couldn't have taken the best and the greatest decision of your life. But there's something here. Even though we have this wisdom at the new birth, we also receive a capacity to receive more. You see, the water of life does something for us. The moment you drink that water, you are satisfied and dissatisfied at the same time. You come into a rest, and yet at the same time, you are eager for more. And so when you have this wisdom at salvation, the moment you are born again, you have this wisdom. It also makes you more thirsty or hungry or more desirous for the wisdom of God. So with the initial measure of wisdom that we receive, we also receive a capacity to have more wisdom, to have the greater ability to apply divine truth for purposeful living. The question then is, how do we as children of God get more wisdom from the Lord? One, by studying the scripture. That's why it's so very important that when you become a child of God, you will give yourself to the private personal, devotional study of the Bible. We call it quiet time. And you will find that as a child of God, your heart will be desirous to read the Word of God, hear the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God. And I also want to join, memorize the Word of God and apply the Word of God. I think where we make many mistakes or where we make mistakes is that Sometimes we hear the word of God and we never meditate on the word of God. And, um, you know, I've observed Christians in many, many places. I see that sometimes a lot of Christians, maybe not everybody, but a lot of Christians will hear the word of God for one hour. And yet we cannot meditate on that word of God for five minutes. Or sometimes we hear the word of God for such a long time. We cannot pray, drink, in, meditate, apply the word of God to our lives. Because of that, it appears that we are not growing as fast as we should grow. But it's necessary that you will make a quality decision that if you want to increase in the wisdom of God, the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom revealed in the word of God, we must study, we must hear, and we must listen to the word of God and meditate on what we hear, as well as apply what we hear. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I'm sure if you're like most Christians, we have more in the head than in the heart. We know more mentally than we receive and apply spiritually. And here it's telling us, let the word of Christ not remain in the head, not remain in a mental makeup. Let it dwell in you, in your heart, richly. And I know only one way that can be done that you don't only stop with reading or with hearing, or you don't only stop with studying the Word of God. Have you ever noticed some people that study so much of the Word of God? And after studying, they go out and they do some foolish things that surprises everybody, that will, that will say, that fellow is almost a talking Bible. He knows the Word of God. You know the problem with him? He reads, maybe he hears, Maybe he studies, it's in the head, but never in the heart. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom.
Because that same scripture that brought about faith in our hearts to receive the Lord, the wisdom of God in our hearts, that same word will make us wise in the temptations and the problems of life. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. Which means then, hearing the word of God, meditating upon the word of God, applying the word of God, obeying the word of God, makes us strong. You know why we have so uh, much of shallow uh, Christianity? And we do not have enough commitment today. It is not so much because we are not reading the Bible. I think we are reading the Bible. And it is not because we are not hearing the word of God. I think we are hearing the word of God. But I think the problem is we do not meditate upon the word of God. And um, as I have related with people, I have found that this is a common problem. Not only in our country, Nigeria here, but all over the world. I'm so surprised how people react or relate to the word of God. That we do not take enough time to meditate upon the word of God. But it's as we meditate and apply on the word of God, we will have wisdom. You know, in my own personal life, I found the study of the word of God very, very important and essential. Now, a lot of people may know that I've never gone to a seminary. I've never done real theological training. But then I apply the word of God. I read the word of God. I listen to the word of God every time. And I try to see all these stories in the Bible on leadership and teaching and a lot of things. And I do my best to apply them to my personal lives, to the work I do, and to the people I relate with. And the more I learn, the more I see that I still need to learn. The more I have got, the more I become thirsty for more. And I want to submit that to you, that as you get more and more in the Word of God, into the Word of God, you will find this wisdom increasing, abounding in your life. Number two, I'm talking about how we get more wisdom from the Lord. When we enthrone Christ in our hearts, will have more of the wisdom of God. You see, when we are born again, Christ is present in our hearts. Isn't that what he said? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice and he opens the door, I will come in unto him. So then, when we are born again, he becomes present, but he may not be prominent. And we need to work on this all throughout our Christian life that the present Christ will become prominent, not only that, he will become preeminent. That's what I call enthroning Christ in your heart. You dethrone self, and you allow Christ to take the seat, to sit on the throne, and every time you follow him, you allow him to guide, to instruct, to lead, you allow him to control every area of your life, and he is the wisdom of God. And when it becomes present, prominent, and preeminent, you just find that you operate in the wisdom of God because he'll be talking to you every time. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and he never says anything foolish. He never says anything misleading. He never says anything that is the wrong decision after looking at all the circumstances in our lives. So if we listen more to him, and we allow him to lead and control, to guide and instruct in our lives, we become wiser and wiser every day. Colossians chapter 2. And in verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So then, as I allow Christ to direct and to control, I know that I will have more and more wisdom. 
I know that sometimes, uh, you know, we sometimes say thoughtlessly that it's either Christ will have all of you or none of you. You know, sometimes we say that without thinking. But if you look at your own life, as I look at my life, you will see that the more we grow in the Lord, the more we allow Christ to be prominent and preeminent in our lives. Obviously, at the moment we are born again, we think he has every area, every department of our lives, but really he does not. And if you know anything about the Christian life, and I believe you know, you know that daily we are dying to a lot of things. Daily we are growing in our Christian experiences. Daily we are giving him more and more chance in our lives. Daily the things that were important maybe three years ago are not important to us now. I know we think Jesus is Lord and it's a good confession. But if you look at your Christian life, you will see that when we say Jesus is Lord, for most of the people, most Christians, it's only Lord of a certain percentage of their lives as we make him Lord over every part. More and more, we operate in the wisdom of God. Number three. To have this wisdom I'm talking about, as we desire, as we punch after the wisdom, we need to pray. That's what we're told in James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Oh, you see, but we say that he has uh, wisdom. Why then are we saying that he should still ask? You understand? Like what we shared yesterday, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. But this man or this woman is not a fool. He knows there is a God. We said yesterday, we cannot live independent of God. If we try to, we'll be foolish. This man is not trying to live independent of God. He's depending upon God. That's wisdom in itself. He knows that within him, he cannot have all that he needs to live a profitable life. Therefore, he is asking of God. He has a measure of wisdom. He's wise enough to depend upon God. And yet, he's wise enough to know that he's not wise enough. That he doesn't have as much as he actually needs to be able to cope with all the things that come to him in life. Therefore, he is asking of God, and God will give liberally. That means he will give as much as he needs. But not only that, number four, associate with wise, maturing Christians. Associate with wise, maturing Christians. You see, the way the Lord has built us up as a body, we cannot live in isolation. You do not have all the answers. And there are times that you will need the companionship or partnership or association with your fellow brother, your fellow sister. But make sure that you are moving with the people that they themselves are maturing. They may not be complete, completely perfect, completely matured, but at least they are making progress. They are maturing in the Lord. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Therefore, associate with the people you recognize the wisdom of God in their lives. And you don't have to search too far. God would have provided some people on your campus that have matured more than you have, and you can share with them. That's why, you know, sometimes we have prayer partners. We do not want to solve problems of life all alone. That's why we have brothers and sisters that we're just closer together. We love everybody and we love uh, one another in the fellowship, but we're able to take our problems to so-and-so because he's a friend. He's an acquaintance. He's a person that will share with us just like a real close brother or sister. And it is very good that we do not cut ourselves up from the 
brethren on the campus, from the brethren that are following the Lord, like we are following the Lord. And you know sometimes what the devil does when um, he wants to destroy us, we think, now I'm getting special revelation, special wisdom. You know, I'm one of these uh, special people that, uh, you know, I know more than everybody in the fellowship, and I cannot make that revelation available to the people in the fellowship. I must be alone by myself. Brother, what's the matter with you? You are becoming too quiet. You are not as open, as free as you used to be. Well, you see, when you get into a particular realm in revelation, you don't talk too much to people. You don't relate with people. You just become quiet and get into this type of asceticism. So that, uh, you know, nothing will disturb you. You have a channel from earth to heaven. Your cross must be both vertical and horizontal. If you remove that horizontal bar, you destroy fellowship. And you are not depending upon the cross. No matter how spiritual you are. No matter what revelations you think God is giving to you. Associate with other people. Do you see Paul the Apostle? He said, I knew a man many years ago, whether in the flesh or in the spirit, I, I cannot tell. How he was taken to the third heavens. He said he had revelations that he couldn't even utter to people. But do you remember he said, when I got to Troas and I didn't find Titus, I was troubled in my mind. And I needed fellowship with all these people. He said, Timothy, come quickly. Come quickly. I need your fellowship. And he wrote uh, to Philemon. I said, I hope you are praying for me. And when I get out of this place, I will see your face. We need fellowship. Whatever revelation we have, don't think that you have such a special revelation that if other brethren are talking to you, it becomes a disturbance to your life. You know, some people are like that. They say, I'm waiting upon the Lord. And then they are so sensitive. They are so touchy. And, you know, they get easily irritated. They wear their nerves on their skin because they are waiting upon the Lord. I think if waiting upon the Lord is doing any good in our lives, it will make us more friendly. It will make us more loving. It will make us more open. We need one another. The foot or the hands cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. Neither the eyes to the ears, I have no need of you. We need one another. To be wise listen to other people, associate with other people, move with other people. God has given me a little, has given my brother a little, has given my sister a little. It is as we share together and I associate with other people. I become wiser, you become wiser. Number five, sit constantly under the teaching of the word of God that brings needed wisdom. In Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect, that means complete, in Christ Jesus. That means then you will never be complete without the teaching of the word of God. Because it says, God has given some, not everybody, apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the maturing, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So then, if we're going to have the wisdom we're craving for, if we're going to have the wisdom we're thirsty and hungry for, we must, number one, study the word of God. Number two, enthrone Christ. If he is present, make him prominent. If he is prominent, make him preeminent. Number three, pray and ask for wisdom. Number four, associate with wise, maturing believers. Number five, sit constantly, constantly under the teaching of the word of God. And uh, here... If you don't mind, I need to speak a word to some of us who are student leaders. Uh, you know, sometimes the temptation is this, that when you are the one that brings the word of encouragement, the word of exhortation, 
ministering to the brethren on the campus most of the time. When some of those brethren, some of those uh, students have a word from the Lord through the scriptures, sometimes we don't pay attention. And I know this from personal experience. Sometimes, uh, you know, I see it in a meeting, sometimes in a church or sometimes in other places, and others are preaching. And sometimes I see some preachers, they can talk, but they cannot listen. They know how to preach, but they do not know how to take in. And you know what I'm trying to work on in my own personal life? That I'll be able to listen when other people are preaching. Are you a student leader on the campus? You need other students. Even though God is using you on your campus to be able to teach and instruct and counsel and minister and pray for other people, would you please also still sit under the teaching of the word of God? And of course, when the leaders that God has placed over us in Naipes and the Christian Union, when they come to the campus, it will be good that we open our ears and we listen. Because by the grace of God and by the work of the Spirit in their lives, they know more than we know. That's why they are leaders. Now, do Christians ever play the fool? Because we have been talking now that we are, by the grace of God, wise. That at the point of salvation, we are wise already. And that now that we have been born again, we are becoming wiser and wiser as we look at all these points in our lives and in the Bible. But do we ever play the fool? Is there any danger that new creatures, believers in Christ, might walk or talk foolishly? Can we say that a Christian walks, acts, thinks, behaves, or lives foolishly? Well, you know, sometimes we can be foolish. We ought not to be foolish. That's the very essence of what the apostle is teaching. He's saying, redeeming the time because the days are evil. It says, see then, that ye walk not circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. I believe, and a lot of um, preachers will agree with this, that if there were no danger, Paul the Apostle will not have said, let's walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And I give you this so that you and I can be warned that there is the danger that you and I can walk foolishly if we are not taking care. When does a Christian walk foolishly? Number one, when he does not obey the truth of the word of God. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3. Verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Verse 3, are ye so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Now this tells us, you know, in our Christian lives, we start by faith. That's how we got saved. We started depending upon the grace of God. Do you realize in our Christian lives how we become foolish sometimes? We have started in the faith, but then in the middle of our Christian journey, we begin to depend upon our own strength. How many of us, uh, you know, sometimes will say, I can never smoke, I can never drink. And they are not talking about depending upon the grace of God. They are not talking about being lifted up by faith. They are not talking about depending upon the sufficient power that Christ has to uphold us. You know what they are thinking about? They are thinking about this, that, you know, I know enough now to know that it will be unthinkable for me to smoke or drink or lie or fight or quarrel. Now I can do all that by myself now. You know, sometimes now when we face temptation, we even forget to pray. We're, we're thinking of all the passages we have known. We're thinking of the methods we have heard. We're thinking of what we can do to rescue ourselves from this predicament. It says, are you so foolish? Haven't begun in the spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, tripped you, sidetracked you, that you should not believe and obey the truth. So then it means in your life and in my life. 
when I depend upon my own strength, when I depend upon myself, when I depend upon my experience, when I depend upon what I can do, when I depend upon what I know to keep me and make me victorious, and I'm no more depending upon the Lord alone to keep me victorious. It means, as a Christian, I shall watch, I shall watch out because I'm becoming foolish. And the same thing in your life. If you find that you are not depending upon yourself, you are depending upon the arm of flesh, you are depending upon your knowledge and experience, and not upon the Lord again to uphold you, it means we are becoming foolish. Not only when we are confident are we becoming foolish, when we are fearful, we are becoming foolish. You know why we are fearful? We are fearful because we're looking at the problem and looking at our strength. And we're saying, how did this come to me? I cannot overcome this. I'm fearful I think I will fall. You know why? I think I'm not able to overcome this. If it were a smaller problem that I could handle, then I know that I'll be able to sail through victoriously. Are we not foolish then? Thinking that it is not the Lord that will help us and keep us victorious, but we're depending upon our own strength. And once we have a mountain that is bigger than we can climb in our own strength, we become fearful. Once a situation is happening on the campus that we cannot go to our Bible you know, notes and quiet time, and everything we're reaching down and have a ready-made solution, we become fearful. We started in the Spirit. Let us continue in the Spirit. If we ever go back to walking in the flesh, depending upon the arm of the flesh, we're not redeeming the time anymore. We'll be acting foolishly. We'll be wasting time. We'll be losing opportunities. Walk in the Spirit. Don't depend upon the flesh. Number two, when do Christians become foolish? When a Christian trusts in and he seeks after material prosperity and is not rich towards God. You see the danger today? That in the in Christendom, especially among many people that believe they are honoring the Lord, they are believing the Bible, they are accepting the promises at face value. And every message that we hear talking about the promises of God will also talk about prosperity. Now there's nothing wrong with prosperity if you have the right concept about it. Prosperity is not how much you can get and keep for yourself. Prosperity is how much you can give to bless the lives of other people. You know the ideology today? Get all you can and can all you get. Keep it. Never allow it to go out. And that's the idea that people have about prosperity. They have the thing they cannot spend it. They cannot give out to people. They cannot even help the Lord's work. They cannot give the time, the talent, the treasure to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. You see, we become fools when we begin to amass wealth just for the sake of having wealth. And we become rich in material things, but we're not rich towards God. In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 18. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool. You see how we can become foolish? By thinking only about self, by misunderstanding or misinterpreting the promises of the Bible and thinking that we can seek money, material wealth, for its own sake. You know what the Bible says? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. After that, all these things shall be added unto you. You know, sometimes we need to analyze the prayers we pray and the things we're asking the Lord. And if you examine, you know, your prayer, if you are like the average Christian, it is, Lord, give me this. Lord, get me that. 
Lord, when am I going to have this? Lord, when am I going to have this? Have you noticed in our Christian lives that prayers of intercession takes a very small percentage? It's a prayer of petition that takes the largest proportion of our praying. I don't think it should be like that. Let's learn from Abraham. Let's learn from Moses. Let's learn from David. Let's learn from Paul. Let's learn from our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. The prayer of intercession. Giving unto other people. And you see in the Madrash, after money, after, this, after material things, do you know, there are some people, Christians, that will not even listen to anybody that doesn't emphasize all the promises we can get, we can have fulfilled in our lives. But look at the word of God. As we preach the word of God, we should make everything balanced. You know when you read the part of the word of God that says, the poor ye have always with you. And because us don't know what to do with that verse. When it says Lazarus was poor, we don't know what to do with that statement in the Bible. And when you look at all the people in the New Testament that they lost their property because of persecution, we don't know what to do with those verses of Scripture. I think we need to be balanced. And we need to be rich towards God. And also, of course, God can supply our need. Not everything we want, but what we need, what we really need, the Lord can supply. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. From verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Brothers and sisters, let's be sincere. I think this verse of scripture has been thrown away, erased from many people's Bibles. They do not believe that godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. I know that there are people that will tell us, you may be poor and still have the love of money. That's true. But you know you can be rich too and have the love of money. You can be rich too and the only thing you are looking for is not how you can be deepened in your faith. It's not how you can get nearer and closer to the Lord. It's not how you can prepare for the second coming of the Lord. You can be rich too. You know, money has uh, something that it does to us as human beings. The more we get, the more we want to get. The more we are keeping, the more we want to keep. The more we have tasted of what money can give and what money can buy, the more we want to taste. That's why a Christian should be very careful. He does not become foolish. Because it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And you know, sometimes even for us ministers, it's you know, very, very dangerous. Because you see, you start your ministry by praying to the Lord and saying, Lord, I have a vision, I have a revelation. I have a burden. I want to reach out to people. And you know those days, uh, if you are a minister who has been ministering for a long time, we didn't care for money. We didn't care for anything. All we cared for is an opportunity to minister to the people in need. But you see, people who are not careful, they get to the situation in life where they wonder or where they feel, now what will I get if I go to that fellowship? What will I get if I go to that area of the ministry? And sometimes some of us even change churches. We're preaching in a particular church, and that church is not paying well because maybe they do not have the money, but they have love. They're rich in faith. They're rich in commitment to the Lord. They're rich in sacrifice, sacrificing their time for evangelism. But they do not have a lot of money to be a blessing to us. And we see some other congregations that will give us maybe more money, more pay, more salary. You know what some of us preachers do? We tell these people, we say, well, we're sorry that we have to leave you. The Lord is leading this way. How come the Lord is always leading to bigger salary? 
And the Lord is never leading us to the man, the lonely man from Macedonia. Come over and help us. But we don't have any church building. We don't have any radio program. We don't have any television show. We don't have any money we're going to give you. You know where we meet now? We have some women meeting at the riverside. That's all we can get. No money to rent an apartment. But the Lord is calling. Come over and help us. How is it that the preachers of today were no more being called to Macedonia, where there is no money? Anytime the Lord is leading, the Lord is leading us to where we can have a bigger car a bigger apartment with everything furnished and air conditioned. And we say, isn't the Lord good? Well, the Lord has always been good. Before you made a change, before you left that church, the Lord is always good. Let's be very careful that we do not become foolish. Number three, when we operate in worldly wisdom rather than godly wisdom, we become foolish. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So then, brothers and sisters, when we use the maxims of the world, the proverbs of the world, the principles of the world, when we depend upon psychology, philosophy, the traditions of the world, Instead of depending upon the word of God, we are becoming foolish. How do you tell the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God? For one thing, the wisdom of the world is always telling you about self-preservation, self-promotion, self-projection. But you know, the wisdom of God is always lifting Christ up and putting you at the background. Let's check up our motives. Let's check up the reasons why we do what, what, what we do. And we will discover whether we are operating in the wisdom of the world or operating in the wisdom of God. But understand, whenever we drift, whenever we are sidetracked, and we operate in the wisdom of the world, we, unfortunately, who ought to be wise in Christ, were becoming foolish. Number four. When... We neglect Christ's word of righteousness. And we take to man's word of self-indulgence. You see the word of Christ, it will cut a lot of things away from our lives. It's what prunes. It is what purifies. And it's what leads towards perfection. But man doesn't like that. We like the things that are convenient, or the words that are soothing, or the things that are smooth. But you see, in our lives, when we leave the word of Christ, and then we are going after the thing that will be convenient for us, comforting to us, we're becoming foolish. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 26, And everyone that heard these sayings of mine, and doeth them, doeth and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And you know, brothers and sisters, as I examine my heart and my life with the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, a lot of times I need to ask myself, am I still doing that word? Now think about this Blessed are they that are poor in spirit. In this day of image building, is it possible for us as Christians to be poor in spirit? Think about, blessed a day that morn. In these days of rejoice in the Lord, I say unto you, rejoice. No sorrow, even for sin. No sorrow, even for the blemishes and the frailty and the weakness and the shortcomings in our lives. Is there any room for mourning in our lives? You see how we Christians easily debate, and it says, Blessed are the meek. Now, can I be meek today? Can you be meek today? Can we be meek today? Will that not be a sign of weakness when every Christian is boasting and bragging about who they are, about what they have got, and they're exaggerating about what they're doing, about, you know, all the things where they have gone and where they have not gone? 
Is it possible for me? And is it possible for you to be meek when it says, Blessed are they that thirst and hunger after righteousness. Now can I be thirsty after righteousness? And not be thirsty after, you know, spiritual gifts. And you know, we're thirsty after spiritual gifts because we want to help people. And it's good to want to help people. But sometimes it's not only to be able to help people. Why don't I hunger and thirst after righteousness? Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are ye when you are persecuted. Can I take that today? Can you take that today? You see, we become foolish when we neglect or reject Christ's word of righteousness. And we take to man's word of self-indulgence. Number five. When does a Christian become foolish? When he is thoughtless and careless, not praying and preparing for the Lord's coming. You see, in this gone by, if you read people like R.A. Torrey, you will see that uh, those people like Moody, like Billy Sunday, like, you know, those evangelists and teachers and preachers of the past, like J.C. Ryle, if you read these people, they talk almost all the time of the coming of the Lord. And um, years gone by, we also, many of us, we spoke about the second coming of the Lord. Now, can you, do you realize how today, in uh, our own uh, sleek or in our own clever manner of thinking that we can do all this by ourselves, we can program, you know, activities of the church, activities of Christendom, without even thinking about the timetable of the Lord. Many people don't talk about the coming of the Lord today. In fact, some people say, well, I'm busy talking about his first coming. I don't have time talking about the second coming. I think that is unfair. I think that is a careless attitude to the word of God because Jesus talked about his own second coming. And Paul spoke about a second coming. And Peter spoke about the second coming of the Lord. And all the apostles of the, uh, in the New Testament they spoke about the second coming of the Lord. In fact, you will find that the prophecies concerning the second coming of the Lord lead us the whole Bible, if you excuse that expression. That is, it covers every part of the Bible. But you know, brothers and sisters, we become foolish when we become thoughtless and careless when we are not praying and preparing for the Lord's coming. In Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 from verse 2. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. What made these people foolish? Look at it in verse 6 and at midnight. There was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lambs. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lambs are going out or gone out. They were not prepared. They were not ready. What's the counsel, the exhortation of Christ on the basis of that parable? Verse 13, Watch therefore, for ye know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. I call the church here tonight to carefulness thoughtfulness to praying and preparation for the coming of the Lord. Number six, we become foolish when we are slow of heart to believe God and to believe his word. In Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 25, then said he unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now can we say that this verse will be limited to those two believers, disciples, on the way to Emmaus? Don't we know that this verse applies to a lot of Christian people today? Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I dare say today, there are many people that cannot see beauty in the Old Testament. 
They cannot see truth in the Old Testament. They cannot see Christ in the Old Testament. They do not know the use of the Old Testament. And aren't we foolish when we just abandon such important part of the Word of God? Do you remember, brothers and sisters, the New Testament church had nothing to work with, had nothing to preach from except the Old Testament. In fact, when you hear of scriptures in the New Testament, you are hearing about the Old Testament because at that time, the New Testament was not yet compiled. And so when they spoke about scripture, about the Word of God, they were talking mainly about the Old Testament. And when the Bible says they went out preaching the Word, and the Lord confirmed the Word with signs following, the Word that was confirmed was the Word of the Old Testament. They were wise. They were wise. And they took the Word of God seriously. How many people today have neglected or rejected the testimony of the Old Testament? The Word of God is the complete Word of God, Old and New Testament. We are foolish when we neglect or reject that word. Number seven, we become foolish when we doubt the certainty of the resurrection of the dead. And when we live only for earthly and carnal gain. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Reading from verse 35. But some will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? The, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bear grain. It may, be, it may chance of wheat or of other grain. But God giveth each a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. I'm sure you know as a believer that Paul the Apostle was developing and emphasizing the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead here. And there were some Christians at Corinth that did not believe the resurrection of the dead. And he told them in verse 32, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts and at Ephesus, what advantages it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Nobody said, the dead will rise again. He said, I, sh I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see, there are people that will not talk about the rapture of the church today, or the resurrection of the dead, or they will not talk about the second coming of the Lord. The challenge we have is that we should be wise and not play the fool. That means, as we endeavor to be wise, one, let's obey the truth. Let's depend upon Christ. We started by faith. Let's keep on walking by faith. We started in the Spirit. Let's keep on depending upon the Spirit of God. Two, let's not put money on the throne of our hearts. Let Christ be on the throne. And let us put money as a servant, not as a master. As, a, as something that can serve the body of Christ and serve the kingdom of God if the money is available. Not that we are working only for money. Three, let's operate in God's wisdom and not in the wisdom of the world. Let us bring back the neglected word of righteousness that Christ has left for us. Let's be thoughtful. Let's be careful. Let's be praying. Let's be preparing for the coming of the Lord. Let's be quick, not slow of heart, to believe the word of God. And let us believe the revelation of scripture concerning the resurrection of the dead, and the certainty of the coming of the Lord for his soul. I've been talking about wisdom, and I've, I told you that we as believers, we have a measure of wisdom. But you see, in times of carelessness, in times of temptation, we may become foolish. But you know, the joy of faith is that 
if we have become foolish, the Lord is still calling upon us. You know, the picture comes to my mind of several of the disciples of Jesus becoming foolish. And Peter said, I go a fishing. And then he got to the place and he caught nothing. And yet, man in his backsliding state will not wake up and know that something is wrong somewhere. But Christ came and said, children, have ye any bread? They said, no, Lord. And you see the love of Christ instead of smiting them or rebuking them or sharply correcting them. He told them where, the, where to throw the net. And they got more than they wanted to have. And they brought it to the shore. By the time they got to the shore, he had prepared meal for them. He knew their need. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the risen Lord. He prepared all that for them and said, come and dine. And after the edge, now looking at everything that they caught, he said, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than all this? I believe he was saying, you are a Christian, but wise. You have only one life. All this will soon finish. Do not play the fool. I've called you to a greater ministry than this. And I believe Peter got the message. He said, yes, Lord, I love you. I had my moment of discouragement and backsliding and playing the fool, but I'm willing to be wise. He said, now don't turn back again. Feed my lambs. I believe that's what the Lord is saying tonight. It says, if we have played the fool in any way, it's challenging us to come back and be wise. And I believe we shall be wise in Jesus' name. Just briefly before I close, let me talk about words of new creatures. Let me remind you again in uh, Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know what, how ye ought to answer every man. Now, if you are just like me, you might find out that in your own Christian life, when I was growing up, I had the greatest problem with my mouth. Not that my mouth is too big, just, you know, problem. You say things that you go back to your other and say, Lord, I need to lick that up again. I shouldn't have said that. Lord, I should have learned more than that. I shouldn't have spoken that way. You know, sometimes you, you know, talk to other people, and the way you talk to them, later the Spirit of God, who always will be faithful, will say, should you have spoken like that? And if you are like every other person, you will see that we have problem with our language. And you know what? Our language or accent often shows our nationality. You know, some, sometimes somebody is talking to you and you say, this brother will be from Kenya. Or you say, this brother is likely to be from such and such a place. How do you know that? Well, I can tell by the language. I can tell by the accent. Even though he's speaking English, I can tell by that accent that this is nationality. You know what? We can tell by your accent, whether you belong to the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. And, and you know, sometimes we belong to the kingdom of light, but unfortunately, because we mix with a lot of people. Have you ever realized um, when you mix uh, during the holidays with people that speak Pidgin English? You go to the market, it's Pidgin English. You go in the community, it's Pidgin English. Everywhere is Pidgin English. And you go to the, you get back to university, and the first day at university, you know what you're speaking? Pigeon English. And they say, what's the matter with you? The problem is this. Although you are still a university student, but you have mixed a lot with a lot of these Pigeon English uh, communities. And the same thing. Sometimes, you know, it is not that you are not a Christian if you are born again. Thank God we are born again. Thank God we are children of God. But sometimes we mix a lot with these people in the classroom with them on the playing field, and almost everywhere we go, and if we're not careful, we pick up their pidgin English. That now you come back to the fellowship, and before you know what is happening, you are speaking, I'm talking figuratively, the pidgin English of the unbeliever, and somebody will tap you and say, what's the matter with you? You are a Christian. Speak correctly. And that's what the Lord is telling us tonight. Let us know who we are. 
do not let us take on the language or the accent of the people of the world. The new man shall have a new mouth. How do we know a new man? Watch his mouth. Watch his conversation. His conversation will tell you a lot about his conversion. If we profess to know Christ, our speech must be gracious. Consistency of life demands consistency of speech. That's why Paul the Apostle said, let your speech be always with grace. What does that mean? He said, never out of your mouth, out of my mouth, shall come out filthy conversation. That will not be gracious. Never should deceit come out, or cursing, or profanity, or flattery, or foolishness, or idle talk, or false teaching, boasting, swearing, or gossip. These are the things that characterize unregenerate mouth. The people that have not given their lives to the Lord. And you know sometimes because we mix with a lot of these people in our careless moments, in times when we are not watching, when we do not realize that we are different from all these other people. They may do it, we cannot do it. Unfortunately, in our careless moments, we have some filthy conversation. And it should not be so. It should not be so. Let no filthy word come out of your mouth. And it says, do not lie to one another because we are members of the same body. No cursing. Are people cursing you? You bless them. And no profanity. No flattery. Uh, you know that uh, uh, in, in the world in which we live today, in fact, flattery is encouraged almost everywhere. And I appreciate uh, my brother, uh, the general secretary has introduced me. Uh, you know some people, uh, when they introduce, they say things they don't believe. You know, they, well, they want to encourage the man. But if you want to encourage somebody, you don't have to tell lies to encourage somebody. And, uh, you know, they say, I've known this man now for how many years? They say, for upward of 30 years, he knew him three years ago. Uh, upward of 30 years, I knew this man. He's you know, always been this. He's always been that. He has the power of God in his life. He is the Paul of today, and you know, he's this and that, and all that. And the man, uh, you know, the man they're introducing looks up. Are they talking about me, or do they have another speaker they are talking about? And eventually, the, you know, he discovers they are talking about him. Well, he says, well, that's just one of those things they say which they don't believe. You know, the church is full of that. And everywhere you go, you find flattery. Is it because we're not Christians? Yes, we're Christians. But sometimes we are forgetful of our calling. We are forgetful of the fact that we as Christians must speak with grace. No flattery. And no foolishness. No idle talk. You know what Jesus said? Every idle talk, every idle word that a man shall speak, he shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. How about boasting? How about bragging? You know, nowadays it's difficult to have some people to teach you the word of God. Because, uh, you know, you might give them a particular thing to talk about. And they cannot talk about Christ for five minutes without talking about themselves for another 30 minutes. What they have done. What they are doing. What they are planning. And a lot of things, everything centers upon themselves. But let's refrain from boasting and swearing. And gossip. What breaks our fellowships? What breaks our prayer meetings? What makes us to lose confidence in one another? Gossip. And it doesn't have to be that way. And therefore, let your speech be always with grace. What does that mean? Is it uh, that when you see your brother, you'll say, the grace of the Lord be upon you? You know, there are people that do that. Every time they see, they see you, just to act as a Christian because, you know, they are obeying the word, word for word, letter for letter. It says, let your speak be always with grace. And they cannot say anything by, without saying, the grace of the Lord be upon you. And, uh, you know, you confront them. Uh, you say, ah, brother, we didn't see you at the breakfast at table this morning. The grace of the Lord be upon you. But uh, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is this. It's saying, let your mouth speak that which is spiritual. That which can only come out of the heart that has been changed and transformed by the grace of God. Speak what is wholesome. 
That's your speech being seasoned with grace, with salt, that which is fitting, that which is kind, that which is purposeful, that which is complimenting, that which is truthful, that which is loving, and that which is thoughtful. You see, sometimes we speak to people without knowing where they are at, without being thoughtful of their condition, without being thoughtful of their need. And it says, the next time you, uh, you encounter a fellow brother, a fellow sister, and sometimes even, um, you know, a sinner, a person you are witnessing to, a person that is bowed down by the problems of life, let your speech be with grace. Would you be kind enough to speak something spiritual? Something that will minister to the spirit of that individual. Something wholesome. Not something destructive. Something complimenting. And if you don't have any complimentary things to say, you are not forced to speak all the time. There is beauty in quietness. We can be quiet when there is nothing to say. If I know that person has a burden, has a problem, and I don't have anything to say that will lift him up, then I should be quiet. But you know some people that say the truth. And you know, it's not every time that you know you can tell the truth. What I mean is this. Somebody has failed his exam. And you know this uh, brother has, uh, you know, been playful all through, you know, the session. And now the result came. And a real beautiful child of God. Only that he needs to learn how to manage his time. And, uh, you know, the result came out and he failed the exam. And you saw this uh, brother and, you know, he's all bad and uh, unhappy. And you say, brother, how is it? And, uh, you know, it's uh, very gloomy and sad and sorrowful. Do you know what happened? Uh, those lecturers failed me. Now, he, he didn't fail. The lecturers failed him. Um, now, you know the truth, but you can't tell him. If you told him the truth, you'll destroy him. If you told him, my brother, well, I'm a Christian, and I like to tell the truth all the time. And I know that you have been careless, you have not been reading, and, uh, you know, it serves you right. I hope you will read this session. If you don't, you will fail again. You know, if you don't read, you will fail. Maybe that's the truth, but you don't have said it. You know what the doctors do before they cut off our hands when they need to do it? They put anesthetics. And love is the local anesthetics that you apply to people before you perform operation on them. You can't bring in your needle of real terrible words before the law. Apply the local anesthetics. Love them. Appreciate them. Comfort them. Sympathize with them. And then, at another time, when you can say the truth without destroying that person with the truth that you are telling, say, brother, can I talk with you? I know that you are doing your best, you are a happy Christian, and you love fellowship, and you love all these, you know, things that make a Christian really happy. And, uh, you know, our life is not just reading and studying and going to the library and going for the lectures and... I really appreciate your, you know, your excitement and joy in the Christian faith. In fact, if I had your joy, I'll be very, very ha happy. And you know the man now is on top of the world. He's very, very happy. And you are saying the truth. You are not flattering him or her. And uh, you say, but uh, brother, I know how hard it is for people like you. are always excited, always joyful, always happy, always, you know, get things going. I know how hard it is for you to sit down and read, but you know, uh, I've discovered that if I didn't read, like I see that you don't have uh, enough time with your, you know, studies. I see that if I didn't do that, I will never be able to pass any exam. I don't know about you, but if you have the same IQ as I have, maybe you need to read like I do. I don't know. Maybe you need to do that. Um, well, he will get the message and go back and say what the man is telling me is I, I should go and read. Uh, there's a way we can tell people the truth without destroying them. And what Paul the Apostle here is saying is speak with grace. Speak to lift up people. Let your words be wholesome, complimenting. Let it be loving and very thoughtful. Not bitter, not abrasive, not vindictive, not sarcastic, not shady. Not angry, not cutting, not destructive. None of those things. If we are children of God, let's see 
how our speech is to our fellow brother, to our fellow sister. Now, from all that we have been sharing together, you know that what we are saying is this, that by what you say and by what you do, you can all either close up opportunities, doors against progress, or you can open up opportunities. The Lord is saying, walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always seasoned, be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. We're well, spoken about the walk and the talk. And you say, who is sufficient for all this? How can I do all this? My brother, my sister, nobody can do it in his, in his own strength. But you know what? We can do everything by the grace of God. The grace of God is sufficient for us. We've got some grace already, but we can have more. We have not exhausted heaven. The Bible tells us our sufficiency is of God. Let's rise up and take more from that sufficiency. And tell the Lord we need more. More of his grace, more of his strength, more of his help, more of his support, more of his love. There is always abundant provision for all our spiritual, material, physical needs. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer that he will help us to be wise, 